Hello, and welcome to our second talk about anatomy. Uh, we're going to be also including methods of neuroscience. So picking up where we left off, we go into the cerebral cortex. And what we're looking at here is a central cut of the cerebral cortex, sagittal, down the middle, and looking at half of the inside. And we can see in this image, the arrow is pointing to the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is a large bundle of axons that are connecting the left and right hemispheres of the brain. The rest of the cortex doesn't, like it touches, but there's not axons communicating back and forth through most of it. There are some small uh, commissures, right? Some very small bundles that connect to certain areas near the thalamus, hippocampus, but generally the major portion of the connection is through this one bundle here. Now, um, the limbic system is deep down also, and we see here another sagittal image, a little pulled out because you see this purple here. Obviously, it's not really purple. We saw the past image. It's more that kind of you know, white-ish uh, beige. This is the hippocampus, and the hippocampus wraps around kind of like the top of the thalamus uh, area. And this is heavily involved in memory. The amygdala is right next to it. You see the mammillary body, which is very close to the hypothalamus and does many of the same functions. However, because it's kind of like anatomically clearly delineated, it's often considered its own thing. So we go into this and we look at what these structures are. And these are involved in emotion, memory, and behavior. A lot of the motivating factors in, in our uh, experiences. So you look at this you know, early development of the mammal. And what we saw was the limbic system. And we see a strong olfactory bulb, which in very early mammals was really the predominant uh, you know, sense was, was scent. And you still see that in a lot of mammals today. Uh, for humans, our vision developed over a very long period of time through multiple uh, changes in species. But we see these different areas that we're looking at. Uh, the cingulate gyrus is at just above the corpus callosum and is cortex, but on the inside of the brain. And this uh, is going to do some processing in relation to things like, you know, emotion, motivation, because of, you know, where it's located. So we see this, uh, these kind of motivating things, eating, drinking, sexual activity, anxiety, and aggression, all involved in these kind of impulse uh, structures here. The midbrain is quite relatively small in humans compared to other species. What we see here is the main components being the superior and inferior colliculus. You have pairs of these on each side of the brain, and superior colliculus is involved in our attention switching for vision, and the inferior colliculus is involved in our attention switching for auditory. And in superior and inferior just mean, you know, one's above the other. These little bumps in the midbrain that are really quite anatomically clear. And the four of them together are all next to each other. They're often referred to as the quadrant gemina. Well, these are the automatic switching. So if you have something like a sound catches your attention and you're looking over trying to figure out where it came from, your attention was switched by this, which suggests there's this biological, hey, this is important, let's pay attention to this here. The tegmentum contains nuclei for some of the cranial nerves and um, part of the reticular formation involved in our uh, attentional processes. The substantia nigra is part of the midbrain, and this is interesting too because this is the beginning of the dopamine pathway that's part of the basal ganglia. The pons is this kind of enlarged area. It means bridge, and it's the connection between the you know, spinal cord, the thalamus, uh, the cerebellum, the medulla, and the thalamus. The cerebellum we see is this, you know, it means like, like little brain. Um, it's a very old structure, contains the majority of the neurons in our brain, 70 billion of the 100 billion-ish neurons that we have in our entire bodies 
are packed into this. And it's believed more recently to be really heavily involved in memory where we keep things, definitely in terms of conditioning, possibly in terms of other things too. Helps to regulate movement, balance, coordination. Now, let's take a look at some of these structures in the brain. How well can we see them? This image kind of draws some lines and numbers and shows us these areas, but if you're looking at this, well, this is a sagittal cut of a human brain. How well can you identify the parts? One refers just to that whole piece, right? the whole thing, not this specific gyrus here, the whole thing. Um, and the rest of them are a little more clear. <clears throat> so the question is, can we identify all of these parts? Well, one is referring specifically to the cerebral cortex. What about two? Well, that is our thalamus. Three is denoting our hypothalamus. Four is the midbrain, and you can see the barely the superior inferior colliculus here. Five being the pons six the cerebellum, seven the medulla, and eight the spinal cord. And we see these here, but it's something that we should be able to identify. These are some pretty major structures. And if we look above here, this big white strip here is our corpus callosum. This opening here below it is the ventricles, right, where they produce the cerebral spinal fluid. These are some big kind of important things to know. Now in our forebrain, we've got the, you know, most of our brain here it's the outer cortex and subcortical regions it's called the cerebral cortex generally um, sometimes the thalamic structures are included in there each side receives sensory information from information and controls the motor for the opposite sides of the body this even includes our visual fields and it crosses between the medulla mostly the medulla a little bit in the pons and the contralateral is like the opposite of where we are. So it's the contralateral sides of the body. What we see here is a number of these structures that are marked, and these are pretty, pretty key things to, to recall. And we've seen this before. We should have a good idea of our lobes of the brain and the breakdown here. Now the subcortical structures get us back into this limbic system. And so again, the thalamus is, we think of it as the relay station or switchboard for the brain. All the information is kind of coming in there. And it's currently, you know, one of the theories of conscious awareness is that the thalamus is connecting these various areas of the brain together that are involved in a certain thought or function, but whatever it is that you're attending to, and they're all rising to this level of consciousness by firing at a similar rate, right? in terms of how many times per second the neurons are firing. The hypothalamus is a small area near the base, and this is associated with our motivating uh, impulses, you know, eating, drinking, sexual behavior, hormones, and physical regulation, physiological regulation. So if you your blood pressure is a little bit high, your hypothalamus is going to work to bring it down. You are a little dehydrated your hypothalamus is going to work to constrict your blood vessels to maintain your blood pressure. So there's going to be all of these, these things that are going on in terms of regulation here. Now, we also look in the subcortical area about uh, to the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is particularly interested, as noted, because this is a um, structure that actually contains not just forebrain, but also midbrain structures, right? Because the um, uh, substantia nigra is going to project up through there. Other structures here are the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus palatus. And these are generally going to be around the thalamus, kind of like wrapping around uh, the thalamus. And they're involved in motor, uh, procedural memory, like our memory for how to do things like drive a car, ride a bike, and emotional expression, uh, important for attention, language planning, and cognition. And the way that we talk about the basal ganglia is often through the descriptive definition. You've got the dopamine pathway and you've got motor learning. They're heavily involved in both, but you will actually see slight differences in how the basal ganglia are defined based on 
what we're actually paying attention to and want to actually talk about. And you see, here's your thalamus, and all of these structures are basically wrapping around here. The nucleus accumbens isn't always included. That's more of a forebrain structure that has to do with, um, you know, pleasure. But because the dopamine pathway is running through there, right, from here up through the forebrain, we can kind of see it included here. All right, above the spinal cord, widens where the pyramidal tracts pass from the body to the opposite sides of the brain. So coming up the spinal cord, crossing over, which is this, the medulla, the pons, the thalamus, or the cerebellum? And the answer is the medulla. In fact, where the spinal cord widens before you get to the pons, that is the medulla, and the reason it widens is that's where you're crossing over. This helps to regulate movement, is involved in shifting attention. Same options, and this one is the cerebellum. This can be described as the switchboard or relay station for the brain. And this one is going to be the thalamus. Let's go on to the forebrain structures. These are composed of several structures that lie on the dorsal surface of the forebrain. Now remember, dorsal is like the, the, the back here. The uh, ventral is going to be down here. And so we're looking at, okay, where is this going to be? So you've got the nucleus basalis. You've got the uh, receiving input from the hypothalamus and basal ganglia. You can you see it way down here. All right, so here's the dorsal surface of the forebrain. Uh, you send the axons that release acetylcholine to the cerebral cortex. And it's important in arousal, wakefulness, and attention. The basal forebrain contains this nucleus accumbens, the nucleus accumbens being part of the dopaminergic mesolimbic pathway. It's active in cognitive processing of emotion and reward uh, motivation and reward stimuli. It contains GABAergic neurons, right, which means you've got a GAB, major GABA, path, GABA pathway here. And the nucleus accumbens is also the septal area is often considered to be almost in that same area. Basically, you see the dopamine pathway running up here, right? That's the key. Well, you're running through here. Well, when the Olds and Milner study, that was the one where they had the rat in the little Skinner box and with the little lever, and they had the electrode that went into the rat's brain. And the rat could control the stimulation of that electrode electrically by pressing the lever. Well, this electrode was going to be stimulating this area here. Right, so nucleus accumbens, septal area, and every time the rat pressed the lever, the rat would basically pass out from a high uh, that they describe as like 10 times the orgasmic experience. So this incredible release of dopamine would basically just like overwhelm the rat. The rat adapted, and the rat would eventually continue to press this lever. And when the rat was then given the option to press the lever for the dopamine boost or over here a lever for food, the rat never left the dopamine lever until it eventually starved to death. But one could imagine pleasantly. Um, the idea is this is part of the addiction pathway. And if this doesn't show us how powerful this is, like this dopamine system is, then I can't imagine what else would. Right. The dopamine rewards have been so powerful they can actually blot out things like, you know, feeding. The hippocampus is the structure here. We see it in red down here. We see it in here. So different images of the brain. Here's a coronal image, right? A cut down like this. And here's more of a see-through, you know, where is this in the brain? You'll see that it's embedded deep in the temporal lobe which is one of the reasons we see a lot of memory associated stuff with the temporal lobe, because the main component of putting things into long-term memory, specifically things related to ourselves, our own experiences, is here in the temporal lobe. Um, not all memory is working here, but what we see is that areas around the hypothalamus, or I'm sorry, the hippocampus are heavily involved in memory. And a lot of this has to do with things like um, specifically information that we know, not just about ourselves, but it's also been associated with information about facts and things. 
The ventricles are these fluid filled cavities, right? And they contain the cerebrospinal fluid and are also responsible for the materials that make cerebrospinal fluid. It provides cushioning. It is also the pathway for removing debris. It stores hormones and nutrition for the brain and spinal cord. So one of the main things is this important flow of fluid, which is going down. And remember, our cerebral spinal fluid doesn't just exist in our brain. It's in our spine, too, right? The dura, right, these layers of these meninges aren't just here, but all the way down our spinal cord. And when they do, like, for instance, a, a lumbar puncture, what used to be called a spinal tap, they're going through the dura, which is why you can sometimes get side effects, a little bit of leakage, because this is a pretty hard thing to puncture through. And the cerebral spinal fluid is going to be not only, you know, helping to store hormones or nutrients, but also get rid of toxins. Our brain is building up toxins over time while it functions. And our ventricles are producing cerebral spinal fluid and allowing for this flow to help get rid of these things. Now here's our meninges. As mentioned, these wrap around the cerebral spinal fluid. So what are we looking at here? Well, this is the skull. This is the layer of the meninges. So you've got three layers of meninges, and it looks like this is the dura, this white layer here. The dura mater is going to basically be this the really kind of thickest, most um, protective of the meninges. Now, your skull does a good job of protecting your brain. Cerebral spinal fluid does a good job, too. But you've got these things that wrap around your entire nervous system in order to, to also uh, help that. Under here are two more layers. The pia mater is going to be right against the brain, right? Basically, almost like a wrapped tightly in cellophane and kind of helping to maintain the structure of those gyri and sulci, keep them kind of held there, kind of going in to these peaks and valleys. In between those two layers is the arachnoid, which isn't really visible here. Like this, uh, it's supposed to look like spider webbing, like really fine. It's not this. These are blood vessels. It's so fine that it's hard to see, really hard to see, but there is that layer in there. Now, you don't have really pain receptors in the brain. You do have them in the meninges. And so one of the um, causes of migraines for people is believed to be uh, inflammation of blood vessels in the meninges, like swollen blood vessels in the meninges that are then putting pressure on these pain receptors. Meningitis, you may have heard of. This is inflammation of the meninges, and it's incredibly painful because you've got, you know, these kind of swelling that's putting pressure on the brain. Anything that's putting pressure on the brain is bad for you. Um, all right. How about some stuff on memory? We talked about this. Which of the structures here do we think of primarily when we think about memory? Specifically for putting things into long-term memory. And the answer here is the hippocampus. This produces fluid that cushions the brain. What is this going to be? Hippocampus, ventricles, basal formation, or basal forebrain, or thalamus? And the answer is ventricles. Now, here is a big topic and a lot of information packed into one slide. So let's take a look at what this is. What we're looking at the lower left here is an image of the brain. And what we see are the places the cranial nerves attach. So you've got your central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord, and your peripheral nervous system, which can say, we think of it mostly containing our spinal nerves, but we also have a number of nerves that connect directly to the brain. And these things that connect directly to the brain are these cranial nerves. They don't all work the same way or connect the same way. For instance, the olfactory nerve connects very um, directly into your limbic system, right? One of the things that we notice about scent is scent can create a powerful response, an emotional response with us, and also a powerful memory. You might smell something and it brings up something from a long time ago. I I was dining recently with a, at a, with a friend and uh, they had um, 
a couple, and they had uh, got some chicken, some uh, specifically like a, from a Korean fried chicken place, and uh, uh, there was a, a dipping sauce with it that, to me, the taste of it was associated very strongly with Christmas, right? So there was something about the flavor that was associated with the scent that immediately evoked uh, memories of, of Christmas. So something about this flavor and smell because smell is the predominant part of taste, was kind of connecting directly into a memory a memory system, kind of like a setting the scene kind of thing. So this is very common, and you've certainly had an experience like this, where a scent creates some kind of immediate response. Now what we see is that's cranial nerve one is the olfactory, and we're not going to worry about all of them, but we are going to think about some. So one is important. It's big. The bulb is big. The optic nerve is two. And we care about the optic nerve because the optic nerve is also connecting basically directly to our thalamus, right? It's not good. Most of our cranial nerves are going through our hindbrain, basically our pons and our medulla. You got a little bit of stuff happening in the midbrain level, but these are the two. One and two are the cranial nerves that are connecting directly to our cerebral cortex. Now, two makes sense because what do we have? A ton of visual information. It's being processed in our eye because our eye is doing this, you know, neurological brains, you know, basically brain processing, um, brain tissue that can do processing like the rest of our brain does. It's going to our thalamus, and our thalamus is then sending it to our occipital lobe. Now, when we look at the rest, you see that there's a number of nerves that are involved in um, taste, for instance, right? Like our facial nerve, okay, is going to be getting stuff from our tongue, our glossopharyngeal nerve, and also our vagus nerve are going to be getting information from our tongue. Um, we also see that uh, our other major ones are going to be eight. Okay, so eight is involved in hearing. Now here it's called the stereoacoustic. We also tend to call it the vestibular cochlear, and we also call it the auditory. Now, vestibular cochlear is because the organ of audition is you know, the cochlea, and it's connected to the, ves the vestibule and the vestibular organs, which are associated with things like balance and head position. So vestibular cochlear is probably the best word for it. Auditory is, is useful because just remembering it's the auditory nerve can help us to recall the rest of those things here. The other one that we tend to focus on is the vagus. The vagus is the nerve that leaves the head and neck area and runs down to the stomach and intestines and organs. So basically one nerve is controlling all of that information, both sending information to the organs in the gut and bringing information back from it. And so we see where these things connect here and we see what they do. Now, here are the ones that I care about. This cranial nerve is associated with visual information, 2, 8, 10, or 12. And this is cranial nerve two. It is the optic nerve. How about internal organs? Two, eight, 10, or 12? And the answer here is 10. This is the vagus nerve. Now we take all this information and we put it together. Well, illusions help us to understand the word, the world. We have, for instance, the McGurk effect, where if I make the mouth motions for ba or the mouth motions for fa, you see the difference in my mouth, right? Ba, lips together, fa, right, my lip to my teeth. Well, if we play the same sound, ba, 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 over and over, but I make the fa movement, our brains perceive it as fa which means we've got conflicting streams of information. We're holding on to the, to the auditory and adjusting it based on the visual information because we've got this conflict, right? And when we have conflict, we do our best 
to make sense. There's a number of areas active, heavily tied together by the thalamus. So these are our major areas of anatomy, and we certainly want to go and understand, you know, the parthenocerebral cortex, limbic system, midbrain, hindbrain, uh, and what these things, you know, um, are associated with. Remember that the focus of the material covering here, what does it do, where is it, and what is it near? Now, how do we know what we know? We're going to go through these major methods of neuroscience, and we'll go through each of these. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple here and then give you examples for the rest. So, brain injury and an anatomy. How we know about the brain in terms of structure has gone back, you know, hundreds of years, even thousands, because you could always uh, dissect a brain. And physicians have been doing this for forever. The idea is there's limited information in just here's a brain, right? And you can look at the structure. A lot of work was done on kind of like the blood vessels, people trying to figure out things like where do headaches come from, migraines. And they made some good progress. If you recall, uh, ancient cultures would do trep trepanation, which was drilling holes into the skull in order to let uh, relieve pressure. This could actually assist in some conditions. And beyond that, you also have the placebo effect, meaning that even if it wasn't helping, um, actually it might make people feel better. It wasn't until the 1800s where we had cases like Phineas Gage and then Broca's patient and Wernicke's patient where you had brains that were, you know, damaged and looked at after death, right? We knew Gage's was damaged because they could connect, you know, through the two holes where the, the rod went through his skull. Broca's patient was seemed to be able to understand but could only like say one word at a very difficult time speaking warnicky's patient could produce sounds that sounded like speech but didn't contain any content and by looking at those two brains after death broken warnicky were able to see that hey there's some localized area that seems to be associated with these language deficits so studying brain injury and studying anatomy was useful and one of the modern techniques is pretty good. Some of the modern techniques are pretty good for that, um, where we can look at what's happening you know, structurally in a living brain. But it was, as time went on, we got these kind of better, uh, better techniques. Now, PET, uh, MRI, and DTI, we won't do separate. We'll talk about MRI and we talk about fMRI. And I'll mention PET there too. And then DTI is diffusion tensor imaging, which is related to MRI. So we'll kind of go through each of these. So EEG wasn't used until the early 20th century, and it wasn't used on humans for a while, and it wasn't really used for anything. Originally, it's basically looking at the signal to see what's changing. And the most useful part of it was in sleep and looking at someone who was sleeping and what was happening in their brain when they were sleeping. All right, so someone would be asleep and their brain would be um, going through different cycles. When we talk about sleeping and dreaming, we'll spend a great deal of time looking at how EEG works. There's other ways of doing it, which is kind of looking at the summation of activity, giving similar stimuli over and over, then adding them together to see what's changing. And it wasn't really until the 80s and beyond where computing technology got really powerful enough to do some really cool analysis with the EEG data. The next thing we have is CT, computerized tomography. Basically, x-rays from multiple directions are pieced together to get slices. So you can see slices, you know, from like a horizontal plane, slices from coronal plane, and slices from the sagittal plane to get a good image of um, where is there damage, um, you know, is there bleeding, things like that. It basically works like an x-ray machine, which means you're getting a pretty good dose of radiation, which isn't people's favorite thing. Now, fMRI 
goes way beyond there. So the first thing was MRI, right? Magnetic Remnants Resonance Imaging. The technical name for this is NMRI, right? Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Imaging. People freak out when they hear nuclear, right? But nuclear in this tense doesn't refer to like boom. It refers to nucleus, specifically uh, the nucleus of atoms. So what the MRI machine does is it is a incredibly powerful magnet that causes a portion of your atoms to line up. As your atoms line up, they then would knock them off balance, right? They basically hit them with another magnet to knock them over, and then they would see how long it took them to come back up. And we would get information on the density of tissue, right? Looking at the difference between water, uh, basically how much water was in tissue, looking at hydrogen atoms, and this would give people an idea of density changes allowing us to look at structure. So this image here in the upper left, you see the red and the blue? No, that's not the part we care about. We care about the gray. The gray is simply an image of density, basically the density of water. The surface showing our gray matter and then deeper the white matter, allowing us to negate an idea of anatomy, which means we could look at things like damage, things like um, tumor growth, looking for density differences in tissue. Now, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, was when we started to be able to now create another thing where you'd get this anatomical structure, like that gray image below is the anatomy. The blue and the red show you, it's more of a, it's kind of like a heat map of function, where we're seeing more and less function. So you get these um, typical MRI, but now you are showing people stimuli. So their brain is active and you're measuring differences between stimuli and you're also looking at knocking these atoms over and waiting for them to come back up to get an idea of density. But this time you're looking at iron. You're looking at hemoglobin and the difference between oxygenated and non-oxygenated hemoglobin. What does this do? Well, when you start to do a task, let's say you start to do a language task, right, or a spatial task, we would expect the areas in your brain involved in language or spatial processing to be active, which means right away we're going to see a drop in oxygenation. Your brain is using up this oxygen. Then we're going to see a spike because your brain is like, oh, we need, we need to put more blood here. Send more blood to this region. And so you're going to get more oxygenated blood coming to that region. And that takes about a second to do. So within about a second, you get an idea of what's happening in the brain, which is pretty interesting. Higher activity requires more oxygen, and we should be able to see that change using fMRI. DTI is diffusion tensor imaging, and that is looking at the movement of water through the brain. Now, because water moves fat basically more efficiently along the axon than against it. If you have bundles of nerves, now we can see where the connections are. TMS, now this is one of my favorites because this is fairly new and it has been recently approved for treating depression. Now, in terms of learning about the brain, that's not the interesting part, right? Now the idea is you can increase the function or decrease the function of different brain areas you can enhance or disrupt in research cases usually what they do is with the tms is you've got a magnetic field that's about as powerful as the fmri magnetic field but it's all being directed to one area of the brain and it can create what are called temporary lesions these temporary lesions basically allow you to disrupt brain function to the point where you might have difficulty speaking. So they hit your Broca's area with TMS, and all of a sudden you can't get the words out. You hit your visual areas with TMS, and all of a sudden you can't see certain aspects, or you can't put things together perceptually and understand what they are. It allows us to get a good idea of brain surface function by turning things off effectively and seeing how you recover and function. All right, this are the methods we discussed.
allow you to view attention changes in real time, EEG, TMS, CT, and fMRI? The answer here is EEG. And the reason is it happens within a millisecond. We're generally able to detect the changes in your processing. So certain things with visual tasks, you can see almost instantaneously that there's a change. fMRI takes about a second. EEG is caught, uh, I'm sorry, and TMS is causing the chain change. CT, static. You're just looking at the brain. This one allows you to see approximately where processing is taking place. Well, the answer here is fMRI. Approximately. That's the key. Because the maximum resolution here is down to a couple of millimeters for the really powerful machines. How many neurons can you pack into a couple of square millimeters? And the answer is a lot. So you're not seeing exactly what's happening, but you're seeing about in the brain where things are happening. TMS is pretty decent for that too, but you're actually causing the change again, so you're not actually seeing that. So that's our area on anatomy. Thank you, and have a good day.